High German Phonology Transcription. Let's get right to it. So the following is from an old High German primer, second edition by Joseph Wright, and an introduction to the study of Old High German by Lenal Armitage. The, link, uh, the, the links to these textbooks uh, will be in the description below. So let's get right to it. So Old High German used the Latin alphabet, mostly apart from runic inscriptions from previous to the uh, Old High German period, or roughly around the time of the Old High German period. Um, but for the most part of our corpus of literature uh, regarding Old High German dialects, the Latin alphabet was used. Let's move on. So, um, however, um, since Old High German is a West Germanic language, or if you will, a, 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 or more broadly, a Germanic language, it ha has uh, sounds that do not exist in Latin, and these sounds will be explored. So, to start off, uh, we have what Lino Armitage describes as a voiceless guttural spirit, uh, or if you will, a uh, fricative, uh, phon uh, phonetically denoted by the X, uh, sorry, not the X, the um, <laughs> sound, as in uh, um, today's German, Buch, so, so it's a <laughs> sound, <laughs> As in buch, buch, you know. So we have that, and then uh, moving on, we have um, number two, cor the corresponding voiced guttural spirit, um, represented by this character, by Lino Armitage. We got to bear in mind that Lino uh, Lino's textbook is a bit dated, so we got to bear in mind that thing is the way they described the linguistics back in his time is a little different than how linguistics is described now. Um, however, it's these sources that we have to bear with because uh, they're the only ones I can access, uh, you know, for free, right? And, and, and you guys can access them too. So um, luckily I have a background in linguistics. I have, a, I have a BA in linguistics, so I can kind of like understand what these uh, linguists of the past are trying to articulate. But anyway, so... We have this voiced guttural spirit, as in South German pronunciation. Uh, this, well, by voiced guttural spirit, I'm assuming he's referring to the g sound, g sound. So like wagen, wagen, or regen, regen. Um, I don't know which part of the German-speaking world uh, where this pronunciation would be present, uh, but definitely we hear from. Uh, Lino Armitage that's South German so this could be uh, pretty, pretty much that which is in, in Southern Germany if you will or perhaps a little beyond that but so Wagen uh, Wagen this is like modern German I'm assuming Wagen or modern dialectal stuff Wagen and Regen so or if we were to uh, take this back 1500 years in the old high German period this, the first word would, would be pronounced as Wagen Wagen and Regen, Regen. Anyway, moving right on. So then we have the voiceless dental spirit. Uh, this is the TH sound as in English think, so a th sound. Or as we can see here, that symbol, for those of you who are not familiar with that symbol, that is called thorn, right? Thorn. So th as in think. So th moving on. Uh, the corresponding voice voiced uh, spirit is uh, th, and this we, we have this as in English breathe and this, so the th sound, so you hear some vibration in the vocal cords, that's what makes uh, a sound voice, where you hear that um, vibration in the vocal cords, a th sound, moving on. Uh, next we have the voiceless dental fricative, this uh, German TS sound, so th sound, so, as we have in today's German zahn, or tanz, so it's a tz sound, tz, tz sound, moving on. Next we have a uh, voiceless labial, labial fricative, a, uh, the pf so, sort of sounds like pf, so, so like p and f, but okay, that's an um, over-exaggeration example I just did there, but like a pf, 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 uh, as we and this is a uh, horse in German, uh, but as small side, this fat is actually a um, uh, word is actually of Latinate origin of Latin origin, um, 
whereas the German, uh, sorry, the Germanic uh, um, a corresponding term would be Ross in today's German, but that's a small side. So anyway, for this sound, we have Pferd, Pferd, and this is uh, a sound that we have here. Moving right on. Um, so with Armitage, he says that as, as, as a result, is it is by no means easy to determine with certainty the exact value of all the symbols and combinations of letters uh, which occur in any old High German manuscript. This is very true. Okay, uh, this could be said for other historical languages, uh, historical documents. It's especially with Old High German. The thing is, uh, what one scribe writes down uh, as far as like pronunciation, one has to like kind of like uh, 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 really uh, sift through. Uh, and decipher whether th this is a phonetic spelling or a um, or non phonetic spelling, where you would have like a sound that is it, like sometimes in some words in Old High German they're not it's, it's not exactly what you see is what you say, uh, but sometimes it is, and that takes some time to really figure out like the etymology of words and this and that what would be the exact pronunciation of x word at, at, at x time at y time so um it's not easy so again i'll just read this out as a result it is by no means easy to determine with certainty the exact value of all the symbols and combinations of letters which occur in any given um old high german manuscript because we've got to get, bear in mind there are dialectal differences uh time differences and so and there, that's why looking into phonology very intimately gives us a good, educated guess on how it would have likely been pronounced, uh, which would surprise people because uh, a lot of uh, German speakers, when they look into this stuff, they're surprised to, to find English-like sounds like a, like the English W, the English S, uh, um, the English TH sounds like th and th. Moving right on. Moving on, uh, the manuscripts, uh, as Armitage uh, says, as a rule, take no account of vowel length. Uh, so for a vowel length, uh, whether a vowel is long or short, uh, this could be depending, this may depend on some factors. Uh, looking at the etymology of words uh, and cognates may give an idea, a good guess of whether a word has a long vowel or not. Um, also, the poetry gives us a clue. Um, whether uh, it's a long vowel or not, like for rhymes or for uh, sake of alliteration, or what have you. Um, but moving on, uh, we learned from Joseph Wright that vowel length was, I, was either entirely omitted in writing or was represented by doubling the respective value of a vowel. So sometimes you'd see like a two A's right next to each other. So then we can uh, assume that, okay, well, this must have been a long vowel. Um, but Joseph Wright also says that, but sometimes also by using the accents, uh, well, diacritics, he means uh, the first one is a, a circumflex and the other is just a acute accent. And here he says the sign, the line on top there, that's called a macron, placed over vowels, uh, is here used to mark long vowels. And the thing is, it must be said that uh, just um, diacritics, um, whether it's a circumflex or an acute accent or macron, this would vary from author to author, right? This would vary from um, uh, the, the linguist, right? So uh, sometimes um, uh, it's not here, but like sometimes the uh, E would have like a, an umlaut uh, in Old High German, and that's to denote um, quote-unquote original Proto-Germanic E, if that makes sense. So it's a really uh, a funnel, uh, phonological uh, symbol, if you will. But yeah, so, but as far as like, apart from that, uh, these symbols here, the circumflex, the acute accent, and the macron are, they more or less all have the same function of, of to, to distinguish between long, uh, long vowels from short vowels, right? And this, and this varies from author to author. Moving on. So uh, Armitage uh, says here, occasional, occasional, Though never consistent, efforts are made to distinguish long vowels. And he's more or less uh, parroting what uh, Joseph Wright here says. Um, so, um, so, number one, by writing them double, 
as we see here in, in, uh, in today's German, uh, Seele, um, or Seele, depending where you are in, in the German-speaking world, Avare, Avara, um, and uh, this is in the Benedictine Regel, um, that's what BR stands for, um, not only in the root, but also in the secondary syllables uh, in the text like Isidor, Haraben glosses, uh, and Intation occasionally. So, pretty interesting. Moving on. So, uh, number two, by the use of circumflex, uh, that is like the hat, you see. Um, uh, where I'm from, uh, we call that, we used to call that a, uh, a chapeau, uh, a hat, if you will. Uh, but, uh, but linguistically speaking, this is called a circumflex. And this is uh, used uh, uh, in the Paris glosses and sometimes in Tatian. Um, so moving on. Uh, then we have what is called the acute accents. Um, and uh, Armitage says here, perhaps due to Old English influence. Um, and this is mostly in the Haraban uh, glosses. And so it's like an accent like that. Um, and then he also says that these various systems are used indiscriminately side by side in many manuscripts. Uh, Notker uh, dates around uh, 10, uh, uh, 22. Is the first to use accents with any real method, right? Uh, he marks every long accent with a. Uh, he marks every long accented vowel by uh, circumflex, every short uh, accented vowel by um, acute accent, and often gives a circumflex to a long vowel, even in a secondary syllable. So, which is pretty interesting of, of itself that already in the 11th century, we got Notker um, using uh, the diacritics. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say properly, but at, at least with some practicality, if that makes any sense, moving right on. Uh, depending on the author, uh, some use acute accents more or circumflexes more or a macron. So this is what I was saying earlier. That's something to bear in mind. Uh, in my experience, if you look at uh, English authors, they tend to use macrons. Uh, and when you look at German authors, uh, they tend to use circumflexes. Uh, this is something I, I've noticed. Or some authors, they, they use accents. But whatever, the thing is, each linguist or what have you, uh, uses these diacritics in their own way. So you kind of have to look at what they mean by, okay, uh, an acute accent, what they mean by a circumflex, or what they mean by a macron. But generally, generally speaking, when you see these these diacritics on vowels, it's it's to to, to denote a long vowel. Uh, occasionally, as I said before, you would have an umlaut e in Old High German that, uh, or um, or other old Germanic languages uh, to denote a original, well, quote unquote, original Proto-Germanic e, if you will. Moving right on. Oh well. Uh, anyway, guys. Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe if you're new. And if you really like the channel, please become a patron at my Patreon page down below. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.